Welcome back. This lecture presupposes your viewing of the previous lecture of mine, which discussed the structure of the poem uh, William Blake's Tiger. Here, I'm going to make an analysis of the theme uh, of the poem William Blake's Tiger. Now, when we are going to the poem William Blake's Tiger, we need to understand it on a, on a global perspective. Uh, what I mean by global perspective is uh, William Blake from England and England and tiger. Now, tiger as an animal, is it a very familiar uh, common animal which was found in England during that time? I suppose not. And as claimed by most of the critiques of the poem, it is told that it, the tiger was brought to England by the colonial uh, rulers and the people to England and tiger was one of the animals which was quite a strange animal to watch. And uh, some of the critics really point out that, is, that it is that exquisite view that Blake had that has been brought out to uh, in this particular poem as well. Well, I'm not going in detail to those uh, in a historical background, but let's go to the text and what it says to us. And uh, let's analyze it. So, tiger, tiger, burning, bright. Look at the repetition, which I can, uh, which is literally called alliteration. And uh, the sounds like ta, ta, bur, bur, tiger, tiger, burning, bright. So this alliteration is introducing a sort of a heaviness of the poem and it also talks about the Smithian aspects in this particular text. And if you look at the next part of the text, you have burning bright, which provides an imagery of fire. So burning. And if you see it in the second line, you have the forest of the night, and which is a very mysterious environment. So the context is a very mysterious environment, and you have an imagery of the fire, and there is an alliteration of the sound ter ter, what is it all leading to? It is leading to a kind of an introduction to the protagonist or the poem, uh, uh, the theme of the poem, the tiger. And in such a system, he is shifting the viewpoint of the reader from the tiger to someone who has created it. So what he says is, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Now, if you look at the first two lines or the first couplet, that talks about tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. If you look at the second couplet of this stanza, you see a shift. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? So the focus is now or now onwards is upon that hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry. So now, if you observe it very carefully, the poem is now no more about tiger. It is the hand or eye which could frame thy, thy, your, an old English expression, archaic one, which represents tiger in this context. Now, it talks about the fearful symmetry. Now, fearful is about fear and symmetry is about uh, the skilled creation which is producing beauty. So look at the juxtaposition, fearful symmetry. Now if you look at the uh, part of it, there is a shift from tiger to the creator of the tiger and then there is a shift from forest of the night, a very mysterious environment to the juxtaposed way of posing fear and beauty. So this is how the poem is introduced to us to read, uh, extends, uh, to read. Now, if you go to the second stanza, you have, in what, deep dis uh, in what distant deeps of skies burned the fire of thine eyes? Or what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? Now, if you uh, see the deeps or skies as the, uh, in, as available in the first stanza, uh, first line of the stanza, it is an allusion to the heaven and hell. Deep. Uh, I think I should have mentioned hell and heaven instead of heaven and hell. Uh, 
uh, it is a note for correction because it's rep representing deeps and or or skies. Um, is it okay if we understand deep as uh, hell and uh, um, heaven as the skies? Okay, that's a point to be noted. Now, burn the fire of the Rhine. Look at look once again. Look at it, this imagery of fire which moves along with the poem, uh, uh, along with. Uh, burn the fire of thine eyes. Look at the eyes. Eyes are also uh, burning. Now, while saying that the eyes of the tiger is burning, it is saying, who has dared to create some such thing? So, on what wings dare he? he? No, it is not tiger. It is he aspired, the one who aspired to create you. What the hand there sees the fire. Look at the look at the capability of the creator. The hand which could dare to seize the fire. It can stop it. Holding on to the fire itself is very uh, very inhuman. Or uh, you know, it's a superhuman. But it is a hand that could dare to seize the fire. So look at the enormous amount of capability that has been explored, explored here. Third stanza talks about what shoulder and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of the heart. And when the heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet. Now here the word dread hand and dread feet represents two important things. Uh, it is not very clear whether this is the hand and feet of the tiger or the hand and feet of the creator who created that tiger. We can make both the interpretations and both the interpretations hold good here. Because if you read the poem very closely, it, there is a kind of a shuffling between the, the creator and the creation. And creator is understood through the creator. So, when you, when you see this stanza very closely towards the end of it, you have a direct question. Uh, see, the, see, this question is very important. Did God fear his own creation? Now, this is something very important to understand. Uh, if you remember uh, the Old Testament and Genesis, uh, the God created the world and there is a series of explanations regarding the creation of the world. And after every day's creation, God sees his creation from a distance and smiles. It's the last day of creation he created man. On that basis, if you take that allusion here as well, look at the kind of dread hand and dread feet. Is he really? Is the creator really? Uh, now in a position of feeling happy or a kind of a dreadfulness after the creation of such a tiger. Now in this fourth stanza of the poem, you talk about various things that have been used in the creation of the tiger. The hammer, the chain, the furnace and the anvil. And if you observe that very closely, these things are uh, talking about a smithian or uh, the creator as a blacksmith uh, who, who create such a powerful creation. Therefore, the last line of the text, which is very important, dare its deadly terrors clasp. So it is such a very fearful or a fearsome action that leads to the creation of the tiger. The fifth stanza of the text talks about something very, very important and concludes in a very important allusions to the creator, uh, creation, Jesus Christ, and, and a contrast to uh, his creation and the creation here. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Now, is it quite comprehensible? Now, is it possible to comprehend someone who created lamb, the same creator, is it possible for the same creator to create something like tiger with ferocious, uh, with all powerful creation? 
So this is uh, in, in a way uh, a kind of a surprise that comes to an end with the, with the series of rhetorical questions. So the first rhetorical question here in this particular stanza is, did he smile his work to see? And the second one is, did he who made the lamp make thee? Now these become rhetorical because the answer is implicit. The last answer of the text is quite repetitive except for one change. The last uh, line, first word, could frame thy symmetry or with, with the dare. And that talks about the capabilities replaced by the daringness of the creator. And uh, I would like you to go through the text for various metaphorical understandings of uh, the poem Tiger. And uh, uh, if you meet me in the class, let us discuss in detail about the various aspects uh, furthered along with your other readings of the text. Thank you very much.